A reading from the second letter of Paul to Timothy. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. From now on there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them, but the Lord stood by me and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully pro proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium is the tale of a 243-year-old toy store owner whose toys come to life. Mr. Megorium, who bought enough shoes for his entire life, realizes he's on his last pair. He struggles to find the right words and the right time to tell his staff that he's dying. In one particular scene, Mr. Megorium shares with his top associate, Mahoney, that he's leaving the store in her hands. He first gives her a cube, a block of wood, and tells her if she believes in it, she has faith within it, it will take her on new adventures within her life. And when Mahoney expresses doubts about running the store and begins to get upset, he finally gains enough strength and finds the right words to tell her that he's dying. He looks deep within her eyes and he says, when King Lear dies in Act 5, do you know what Shakespeare has written? He writes, he dies. No more, no fanfare, no brilliant ending, no final real big words. The culmination of the most influential piece of dramatic literature is he dies. And yet every time I read those two words, I find myself overwhelmed with dysphoria. And I know it's only natural to be sad, Mahoney, but not because of the words, he dies, but because of the life he lived prior to the words. Continuously through this epistle, we find out Timothy has doubts and struggles and feels he lacks Ability to be the chief pastor in Ephesus, who he was appointed to by Paul. And during these doubts, Paul does not give Timothy a cube, a block of wood to meditate on, but he gives him his calling and pushes him in believing in this calling, because if he does, it will lead him to new routes and new journeys and new adventures within his life. And in our passage for today, Paul is still encouraging Timothy. But Paul is also struggling to find the words to tell his protege he's dying. And I'm sure this struggle has to do with the life leading up to his death. See, Timothy and Paul are not in the most convenient or comfortable places within their lives. Timothy struggling to pastor churches in a time where luxury and image took precedence over righteousness and sacrifice. It seems everything he's doing is countercultural, pastoring during a time when the survival of the Christian community seemed highly doubtful. Times haven't changed too much, have they? <laughs> it's what many of us face today in our world. And I'm sure when Timothy gets the letter from the personal carrier, he has a sigh of relief knowing his mentor is still alive. But as he reads, I'm, I'm sure he becomes more and more distressed. Reading the words and thinking of his friend Paul sitting in prison in the house of darkness in this dim, dark chamber alone and deserted. 
See, to be deserted by all was not just Paul's way of saying he's scared and lonely. But this phrase plays a role in meaning Paul's source of food and water has departed as well. Securing nourishment fell on the shoulders of the prisoner's family and friends. And at this time, Paul has no one. Just imagine Paul sitting in his cell, holding the few pieces of paper that he has left with a jar of noticeable dried out ink, trying to write his last letter. And as he gets closer to the end of this letter, maybe Paul looks up from the paper and he sees a cup with a little bit of water left within it. Water he's been slowly drinking to savor each bit, not knowing when the next cup would come. And he remembers the quote he used the last time he was in prison, writing to the congregation in Philippi, as for me, I am being poured out as a libation. But this time, instead, he he doesn't add, and I rejoice with you, and I'm glad with you. But he says, and the time of my departure has come. Realizing this really is the last drop. Paul's metaphor is one that yields great influence. He uses this image of a libation, a drink poured out as an offering to a deity to show his essence is being poured out as a sacrifice to God. One writer notes a libation carries special significance. It points to the very usefulness of something to drink. Paul does not choose a pouring out image to suggest wastefulness, but one rather that has a savoring nature. Paul is departing this life, preparing to die, and yet the term he chooses for his poured out self is one of renewal and refreshment. To to drink something that's more personal and intimate, to offer oneself as a drink for a thirsty people. It's quite different than just fading away. Paul realizes he's not just a drink for a thirsty people, but also for a thirsty God. The fighting a good fight, the running of a race, keeping the face traveling to country after country, proclaiming the good news, being the living word. Paul was quenching the thirst of God, quenching that which was a strong desire and craving for God so all would know. God in Christ is reconciling the world and us unto God, quenching a thirst. The myth is told uh, in the summer of 1993, the Coca-Cola product Sprite was needing to change its image. It's needing a little facelift, if you will. Sales were down, and the old campaign of I like the Sprite in you was dwindling. (laughs) (laughs) They were looking for something hip, something fresh, something that would appeal to the younger generation. So Sprite contacted Lowe and Partners, a New York-based advertising agency, who did just that. Not long after being contacted, the agency returned a new slogan to Sprite. Image is nothing. Thirst is everything. Obey your thirst. Sales increased. It was a success. Yet when asking the chief advertising executive what was his inspiration for choosing this slogan, he said, I just love looking through artifacts of political history. And I came across one particular speech, and the speaker made an aside to thirst. So I wrote it down really fast because I knew I could use it somewhere. And when Sprite called me, I used it with them. (laughs) The speech that grabs this attention was from 1971 when former President Ronald Reagan was addressing a gathering of Boy Scout leaders. In the middle of the speech, he stopped, took a sip of water, and looked at the audience and said, now I've talked about a number of different topics today, but if you remember one thing, 
one thing, remember this. Speeches are nothing. Thirst is everything. <laughs> Always obey your thirst. Whatever you are wishing for with your whole heart or striving to attain, whatever it may be, don't leave it to be ignored. Paul, in his writing, is pretty much telling Timothy, the thirst is real. Paul's words and life are to encourage Timothy not to obey his own thirst, but to be, to be a drink offering for the Lord. It's so easy for each of us to revert to our own thirst or desire for this world, isn't it? In the midst of trying to change the world or even thinking that we are making the world better, we forget that there is a calling on our lives which precedes our own desires. Timothy is called to be the next vessel, called to proclaim the message, be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable, convince, rebuke, and encourage, endure suffering, and do the work of an evangelist. And when I hear the calling upon Timothy's life, it forces me to ask, has my life been poured out as a living sacrifice to God? But yet, have I even taken time to discern what it is that God is thirsty for in this world, in this day and age? I would say it's, it's true that God is thirsty for justice and advocacy and beauty and creation care and goodness. But I'll go a little further. Former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, suggests what God is thirsty for is you. It's for you and I to be who God has wheeled, called, and created us for God's purpose. He states, God does not create human ciphers, a pool of cheap labor to whom jobs can be assigned at will. To be is to be where you are, who you are, and what you are. God is calling you by your name at every minute, at every moment, warning you to be you. Because to exist really is to exist as responding to God. Each of us is called to be a different kind of response to God, to mirror God in unique ways, to show God what God is like from new and different standpoints. Yet there's a challenge to this. The challenge is, in order to exist as a response to God, fully living out our calling we must be agents of Christ, which means we work alongside the Holy Spirit so justice, advocacy, beauty, creation, care, goodness, and much more can actually be carried out within this world. The, the challenge is putting feet to faith. And we must reflect into this world the creative and redemptive power and love of God, responding to God with our relationships, our stewardship, our worship, finding ourselves telling the story and acting out the symbols that lay at the table wherever we are, as who we are, and in whatever we may be doing. As living sacrifices, as vessels being poured out, our actions, our words, our deeds are done in response to the God who created us and thirsts for us. Through this, May we, we may realize, like Timothy, we are called and created to be in places that afflict pain, heartache, and some faithlessness. Or even like Paul, find ourselves abandoned, suffering, and headed to a tragic fate. But the gospel we find in Paul's words is no matter the situation or even if the significance of the situation is unknown, the Lord will stand by you and give you strength. And because of that, may we live our lives poured out for God, lives remembering saints like Paul who have poured themselves out so we might find sustenance in their unfailing faith, living our lives as a libation so when we depart, we are leaving words and actions as an encouragement for the next generations of vessels, 
a life quenching the thirst of God in order for us to one day say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith from now on is reserved for me a crown of righteousness, which will be given to me by the Lord, the righteous judge, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for him and have been poured out for him. Paul's words informing us of his nearing death should inspire Timothy and all of us, the purpose of our life. His words yield boldness to rise and be the next vessel, quenching the continuous thirst of God in this world. Well, Mr. Mr. Magorium continues to look Mahoney deep within the eyes, and he says, I've lived all five of my acts. And I'm not asking you to be happy that I'm leaving. But I'm asking you to turn the page. Continue reading. Start the new story. For your life is an occasion. Rise to it. Amen.